Welcome everyone. I'm Sarah Hanewald, Assistant Head of School here at One Schoolhouse for Professional Development. And today I have with me a returning and very popular guest, Leslie Fry. Leslie, you wanna just give a brief introduction and then I'll jump in and share some slides. Sure, you're too kind though. <laughs> I'll start with that. Um, but hi everybody, I'm Leslie Fry. I am the upper school psychologist at SEH Academy in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And then I am also, um, a very thankful abnormal psychology teacher here at one schoolhouse. Great. And Leslie, you had a role last year too that I think has continued into this year. Do you want to just mention that and then we'll dive a little bit more deeply? Sure. I um we're now we used to be the wellness, I was used to be the wellness task force head, um, but we're now incorporating DEI work. So I'm part of the um, DEI and wellness department here at SCH Academy. I guess, obviously, everything with COVID, we thought, you know, it was important to continue this work, um, but we wanted to make it more permanent. Right. Um, so I'm going to share some slides and just talk for a couple of minutes about what's going on here at One Schoolhouse. And then we're going to dive into that work. And I just, I think I have to share that we planned this webinar about six weeks ago. And even <laughs> since then, the landscape has changed, which is the, the story of, I don't know, the decade or, or this really longer time period again and again. And that's why this topic of resilience is really important. Um, on our blog, I wrote a piece called Wired for Resilience, and what you won't see in the blog, but that I will reveal here, is that I found my way to the book that inspired the blog by listening to a, an NPR show called The People's Pharmacy, and it's really about that intersection of science and psychology and health and environmental impact, and I, I can't recommend the book enough, so if you... Um, check that out. I definitely recommend reading the whole book. Next week, we are going to have two heads of school joining Brad, our head of school, to talk about empathetic leadership and how critical that is all the time and now as well. So call for teachers. I happen to have a One Schoolhouse teacher here with us. So Leslie, can you recommend teaching at One Schoolhouse? I definitely recommend. <laughs> um, well, working here at One Schoolhouse, I've loved doing it for the past four years. Um, it's so funny, back in the beginning with Beta Eaton recommending me, I was like, I, I can't do what Beta Eaton does. If anybody knows her from One Schoolhouse, I was one of the science teachers and now um, the academic support director. But um, I've had so many supportive people at One Schoolhouse, from you, Sarah, to Lene, um, to Kareen, and just people who have been on my side this whole time to help me grow as a teacher. And I'm just so fortunate to be a part of this group and obviously um, speaking today, but it just, they're all about growth um, and potential and, you know, and empathy and um, all the great things that you could ask for in a company. Wow, that is a glowing testimony. I want to say thank you because we didn't plan that. So I'm really grateful <laughs> for that. So if you're interested, check out our website and Sienna will put the link in the chat as well. Um, our new student catalog is open. So if you are um, starting to think about next year, and we've already got registrations for the next academic year, so it is not too early. If there are things that you know you want to get students into, please take a look at our catalog and share that on campus. And then I just want to remind everybody that we'll use the Q&A for questions. I think folks are going to have questions for you, Leslie, today. And then we'll use the chat to share resources because there are a number of resources that Leslie's going to mention that will be shared in the chat. So as we often do, we're going to start with a look at our pulse. And this time we were looking at specifically positive psychology, which is something that I know, Leslie, you're um, interested in talking about. And we've had some um, folks who are involved with positive psychology here before. And what are the measures for resilience and how do academic leaders evaluate themselves in terms of these areas? And we talked about this a little bit before. I'm going to leave it up for a minute for everyone to see, but the ability to adapt to change, having that strong sense of purpose, knowing where and from whom help can come, making difficult decisions when the time calls for it, even if they are unpopular ones, and then 
thinking and focusing clearly under pressure. Those are some some important resilience traits and they are, they're tough. So Leslie, what did you think when you took a look at that? I'm gonna stop sharing and I know Sienna's gonna drop in the, if you haven't had a chance to answer the poll, please do. We'd love to have your, your results counted in there. So what did you think when you saw that? Interesting, cause I took it myself. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And, <laughs> and um, you know, the ability to adapt to change. I know we had spoken about this there. It was just really interesting to see how people, you know, right now do find themselves to be resilient because I, I know for myself, um, you know, depending on the day, I might feel resilient and other days um, just because of low energy or trying to cope with whatever I'm dealing with, like the ability to adapt um, it just isn't there. Um, the, to the extent that I'm expecting it to be every day. But it is, um, that was another thing. It, it was interesting because I had this conversation with a colleague who's also very interested in positive psychology and has a master's in it. And one of the things that he said is, you know, um, and positive psychologist is more subjective and like, because day to day, you know, things can change, right? So you mm -hmm. might, you're, um, you can adapt today and you're resilient today, but would you say the same thing tomorrow? Um, so that was pretty interesting to me in terms of the results there. Um, and I loved that last one, but unfortunately, because I'm on my phone, I'm adapting to change because I love it. My um, but that last one was pretty interesting to me as well as we were talking earlier. I think it was. And I think, you know, one thing you and I thought about is if you ask people about change right as you're thrusting a change upon them or after they've managed a change, like their answers might be really different. And that might be a good thing. We might be resistant to change and then find out after all, hey, you know what? I, I really helped my school through this yet another change. And that's something some of the school leaders are dealing with. You know, I think we see it in the students too. Like there, there's moments in the day where they are so heightened with stress or distress and anxiety. Um, and then, um, you know, they have this moment where they're like, I can't function, I can't do. And then, you know, as stress is they've forgotten that that was even part of their day. Um, it's actually funny. I was just thinking about on the TV show, um, This Is Us. That was one of the things that was said was like, you know, the end of the day is what really counts, how the, the end of your day really is what you think about, you know, as the day progresses. Um, so it, it just reminds me of that because, you know, obviously things do, you, you're thinking about different things throughout the day and you're stressing about that. But at the end of the day, when you're settling in and you're thinking about gratitude, what, what does come up? Yeah, that makes that dinner table gratitude or the before sleep meditation where you practice releasing things on the day and focusing on the positives. They actually make sense, don't they? Yeah. So, so when we were talking about this a, a little bit ahead of time and, um, you know, we, we said, hey, we're headed into February and it's cold. The holidays are over. Maybe you're excited about Valentine's Day. Maybe you're not. I had certain sort of, uh, feelings about it, but spring seems really far away. And that's what we were thinking back in November, early December. And then and now, you know, it's kind of worse than that, right? <laughs> and so how are people doing? How do psychologists help prepare communities for this time of year? I mean, it's very, you know, I can speak for my school. Um, you know, just like you said, it's, it's cold. Some people do like the cold, so I won't dismiss that, but you know, it is darker, more. I hear that. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's sometimes just a stress in the air because we're hitting the second, the end of the second quarter, the beginning of the third quarter, and we're all realizing how much time we have left, whether that's a good thing, like, oh, there's only two more quarters left or this, you know, or, oh my gosh, I still have so much um, to do. So I think there's still like this lingering stress, plus the, the fact that we haven't really gotten back into this habit yet, right? Um, we just had a break and now, um, you know, it takes 21 days to create a habit and we're still within that timeline in addition to COVID um, affecting everybody's transition back. So I think there's just so many things to think about um, and so many different forms of anxiety, whether in the... Oops. All 
All right, so while Leslie comes back, I'm gonna share a statistic that she shared with me from talking with other school counselors that we're ask, we'll ask her about, which is many school counselors shared during a meeting of school counselors that they were seeing more than double the typical number of students who needed individual support. And that is, um, that's a big difference. And I think Leslie will be back in just a moment. I have a lot of confidence in that. But when she gets back, I'll ask her about that statistic. And also she shared some resources that are not specifically of the moment. They're actually a curated set of sources from the New York Times, in fact, in working with students and SEL. So I know Sienna will put that in the chat. So thank you, Sienna. Um, and I know I took a deep dive into those resources. Hello. Not to worry, I quoted you to everybody because I had that <laughs> ready. You were talking about meeting with school psychologists and finding out that students, you were having double the number of students. It's definitely been the significant increase in hospitalizations um, when it comes to anxiety or depression and just things being exacerbated, um, you know, in a way that they weren't, none of us were expecting at this age. And obviously, um, there are a lot of students who are struggling with socialization, still um, academic pressures and, you know, um, you know, still, even though it's not that, that the learning piece is still an issue for a lot. Um, there's a lot of delays. And I think it's just trying to adjust for all of us and teachers adjust. Yeah, and so when you think about students, needing more SEL and how does that impact their teachers? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, for some, it comes natural. Take a step back and see the students and be like, today's not the day that we're going to learn about the topic of pandemics or the, you know, history in this setting. Um, and for others, it's, it's more difficult, right? Um, you know, they know what is expected of them. They know that they have to prepare for this AP exam. Um, and so there's not really time to incorporate SEL as much as possible. Um, and, and again, it doesn't come naturally that for them to do that. So it becomes an extra um, thing to work on um, and it feels like extra work. Um, and so, you know, it's very hard for all teachers to kind of adjust to saying we need more SEL and just throwing it in in January versus having it something that we've all learned and worked on internally as well as externally um, to push through. Yeah, and so can, can we unpack this just a little bit more too? Um, when we think about, you talked about the individuality of teachers and their comfort and their capacity so what are supports that leaders can put into place to help it, teachers, you know, not change who they are or be completely different and, but how can they provide those supports? And I just, a couple of people have shared some items in the chat, but they only shared it with the host and panelists. If you would please share with everyone. Um, well, I know for in our school, uh, we are lucky to have somebody who's trained um, in mindfulness. So, you know, during our division meetings, um, we've had them speak and just give a couple of nuggets here and there about what mindfulness can look like. Because, you know, for some mindfulness is just meditation or that's what they think about. But mindfulness is a daily living. So it can really be mindful eating, walking um, and giving little nuggets here and there for specific um, things that you can do in class, whether you're a math class, a science class, or an English class, um, an art, you know. So um, we've been blessed to have that, uh, just little things so that you can feel like your success. And it also makes that teacher who is focused on mindfulness feel like they have meaning and purpose, which is something that I think um, not just in positive psychology, but a lot of leaders can do is just remind people that, you um, they're appreciated um, and that like they're seen and validated, um, you know, and the hard work that they're doing is is going seen or get, getting seen. 
Yeah, and it sounds like what you're talking about are those really specific data points. Like here is something that you can do around mindfulness and adding in the specific thing and then recognizing somebody, not sort of the general thank you for all your hard work, but the thank you for accomplishing this in the face of stress, like really making it detailed and specific. I mean, that was the thing we, we've been focusing on is affirming people. Actually, we did an activity today in advisory, but we did it with staff first of, you know, um, first affirming yourself, because I think we don't do that enough um, and look at our own personal strengths, but then um, affirming another person, like I see you, or I see that you're doing the specific thing very well, um, or you are appreciated for going the extra mile and doing that lunch duty for the Spanish teacher who couldn't do it because they have COVID or, you know, um, I recognize today that how much I haven't been, you know, giving you credit for doing this while knowing, I think like tailoring it and individualizing it, um, your affirmations make it so much more worthwhile. I think that's so important. And when I did that dive into research about agency for the blog post, I ended up, um, didn't all make it in. And so I just, anyway, like I said, read the book, but then also some other places that I went and I've got a link to a research study on, on some of that. You know, speaking of research, one of the things that's making it complicated this year is our culture really praises teachers for work practices that we know are toxic. Right. So there's this mythology that you're supposed to arrive to June, like done and completely drained. And that's awful. Right. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I mean, just like you said, it's, it's kind of toxic at times because I think we, we, and especially, I mean, not to dismiss public school teachers because they do a lot too. Um, but in independent schools, there's a lot of overachievers, just like the kids. Um, so thinking about, you know, we have to work even when we have COVID or we have to do more. Um, and then also that's a form of um, coping with anxiety is over-functioning. So I think people do it a lot more. And I think that it's helpful for leaders to sometimes say like, take the break, you know, um, yeah. uh, you know, I see that you're sick, <laughs> you know, we can find a sub for you, um, you know, and, and also I see that you're sick and I notice that you're still doing it. I truly appreciate that knowing. Um, but it is I mean, because it's still very hard for us to do things when we're depleted. Um, and sometimes just either, whether it's validation or connecting with somebody that can fill your cup a little bit um, because we're living in this time of still feeling like we're isolated. So, so let's talk a little bit and give some advice to leaders. So there is this culture, like, you know, you, you keep on going and you keep on going and we can say, please take, you know, some time for yourself. But then sometimes a teacher will have to say no or somebody else on school staff. And so how do leaders learn to accept that no gracefully and the right way so that the person who gives that no feels affirmed rather than you know, I call it the mom guilt, but it's really the everybody guilt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is still a year of passion um, and, you know, and compassion with ourselves and compassion with others. And really, sometimes it's about taking a step back and getting, gaining the perspective of the bigger issue. Um, just like we recognize with parents sometimes when they're yelling at us about their child, um, it's from a place of care or shame and guilt. Um, you know, we do that as leaders too. I think we have to, you know, recognize that um, there's a lot of that going everywhere, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think for leaders, it is about just the reminder of just like you need that time. Um, so, so do some teachers. Um, and that's how they'll be better teachers um, if they get the time in the break and get to control at least one thing because there's many things that are out of control, out of our control right now. Right. That speaks back to that agency. And you've got an activity that you do sometimes. You alluded to this at first, but thinking about really seeing yourself 
yeah. and learning to affirm yourself so that you can affirm others. And you've got an activity that has to do with some letter writing. Do you mind describing that? Yeah, sure. So um, again, I wish I had my Wi-Fi, but the, the main thing is again, affirmation. So what I think would be important to do right now and give yourself a minute to just affirm one of your core values um, or your inner strengths. If you've done the, talking about positive psychology, if you've done the VIA strength survey, um, just thinking about what your top five strengths are um, and just affirming that for yourself or even something that's done today. So for me, um, it would be, Leslie, I'm proud of you for adjusting um, during a very, a very difficult time, right? Um, or, I'm, and I'm, I'm proud of myself right now um, because I know how my anxiety takes over to um, stay calm in a stressful moment where I have no Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're fabulous. I mean, that's the thing. You're so knowledgeable and you've got such a warm percent of it. It works. And, um, and I said, now we can see your diploma. So Leslie is already super intelligent. Now we know she's got lots of degrees to back it up. And then um, after you've done the affirmation for yourself, uh, finding somebody in the day that you can give the same affirmation to. So just like Sarah did to me and recognizing one thing that I'm thinking about or said to her or even behind me, um, doing that for somebody else and just taking one word or a strength if you know them for them and saying, I see you. Um, or I loved that Sarah today that you are able to actively listen to me and give, and really sum up great things that I've been saying um, because you're just so good at that. You're <laughs> such a <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And before this deteriorates into I, Sarah and Leslie really like each other conversation because we do. <laughs> um, I just want to say that actually we never met until we started doing a couple of webinars together a year ago. Um, but you touched on the listening and active listening. And sometimes I think people feel like the, the elements of active listening are maybe cheesy or you know, I don't know if I really want to do that. Could you maybe expand on that a little bit? And I also want to remind people, we've got one question in the Q&A that I promise we'll get to. And there's some long posts in the chat. I hope they're going to everybody because I, um, they're teeny tiny right now and I can't read them. <laughs> listening really is just, I think also just being present, um, present with the person um, and, and hearing them out. Um, and instead of thinking, because, you know, 47% of the time our mind is going on different things throughout the day, but really engaging with the person who's in front of you and making them be known and nurtured um, in that moment. So I remember early in my career, I went to an active listening workshop and I came home and my roommate was in veterinary school and she had had a really rough day and some things had gone wrong and I was like, oh, I'm gonna practice. And so she was telling me about it. And then I said something and then we had a nice conversation for about 20 minutes. And then afterwards I said, Hey, I went to this workshop. How did you feel this conversation? She was like, Oh my gosh, you were practicing on me. That's terrible. But then she's like, I actually feel a lot better. And yeah. to me, that was really interesting because she was obviously an intelligent adult. Well, if you call, I mean, we were 22, 23. So I don't know if you call us adults or not, but <laughs> I think we were. And, um, but just knowing that really practicing that, I hear you, I'm gonna reframe what I think you just said to me and I'm gonna ask you if I'm correct and, and the impact that that has. Yeah, definitely. And, and not just on children. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, we know how students feel when like they get individualized time with you. Um, as a teacher, it feels the same way for a leader too. We've got a couple of questions here in the chat. So the first one is, um, and not in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, one is, if you are a leader who has lower empathy, and you know that about yourself, right? Maybe you've done some of the reflection and the activities. What are some things that somebody says, you know, I'm not really high on the empathy scale and my school needs me to step it up. What can you do? I mean, I th think number one being compassionate, knowing that about yourself is the first step, right? Um, and being compassionate with yourself because you've 
there's a reason for why you are the way that you are. But I think empathy um, is a muscle. So, you know, practicing every day, finding what things you can do to kind of help you through that um, process. Whether that's like, maybe one day I do check in with somebody that I typically don't, or maybe I have lunch with this person, sit and be in this discomfort, um, because that is how you build that muscle. Um, and, you know, I think little things here and there, and obviously also talking with colleagues and other leaders around you to see what they do um, in these situations, because that's going to be helpful to you too. You don't always have to do everything by yourself, seeking out help um, from fellow leaders. I mean, that's why, you know, I know for in Pennsylvania, we have like our um, PAIS, like that, you know, the sub chapter of NAIS where we meet with a few for with other counselors and school psychologists or a different head of yeah. to kind of talk through like this is what I'm seeing at my school. What are you doing in the specific um, situation so that you have a list that you can write notes and you know um, think about? Okay, this is how I'm going to handle it. So super important. You just touched on two things that I want to touch on. One is sometimes you're the only at your school and you need a peer. Right. Our listserv can be really helpful for that. And and those ad hoc groups, whether they're more structured or less structured. And then you said checklist. And I just happen to have this on my desk because I'm using it for something else. So I'm going to hold it up. The checklist manifesto. I think sometimes if you external what is harder for you and part of this book says that really smart, wildly thoughtful people need the checklist to make sure that the I's get dotted and the T's get crossed so that they can leverage their brain power for something else. I think that's really important. If you are if you struggle a little bit with EQ, make a checklist and then remind yourself, oh, did I see all the, these people in the last week? And if there's somebody who, huh, I haven't, let's go find them. Yep. So it sounds a little maybe cold, but I think it's important. Um, well, checklists are always helpful because then you feel like there's success in the day. Like after you've checked one off, I did that, yes, you know. Um, no, I love a good checklist. <laughs> I love a good checklist. Um, so Emily asked a question in the chat too about um, sometimes it's the little things that can seem to have a big effect. And can you think of anything that maybe you've seen a leader or a teacher do in the classroom that seems small that the effect was really amplified? Really, um, there's, some, there's been a few really great ones. Um, but one of my teachers, I mean, even this morning, um, been having like her students journal for seven minutes each day before class begins to kind of get them to settle in. Um, and it's just a time for themselves. She doesn't check the journals, um, but just allows people to do that. I think that's one of the things I think also, you know, doing an emotional check-in, that was something we used to do as an advisory, but some teachers are taking that on just for their class, you know, zero to 10, how are you feeling? today. Another great one um, that one of the Spanish teachers does is, you know, before they start class, they're like, what are, what's the baggage that you're coming in with? And um, he has the, the students in Spanish, obviously, write down what they're dealing with that day, and then they crumble it up, and then they throw it in the trash. Um, and it's like letting go, you know? Um, so little things here and there to allow to see like you're a human too. I think also, um, you know, it's all about connection, especially when it comes to resilience too, and, and allowing students to know how you're doing that day. Obviously not to an inappropriate level, but kind of saying like, this has been a rough one or, you know, um, like bear with me as I go through mm -hmm. difficult week because I like you, I'm, I'm holding on or hanging in um, and trying to push through. I think that's super important. And what I really like about what you gave us those two examples is that there are opportunities for, for reflection. And reflection is one of those things that we say is important. And then we want kids and adults to do it away from mm -hmm. the actual workplace. And, um, hmm, you know, if we really value it, let's pull it into the classroom and let's pull it into the workday time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, taking a walk with your students and having a conversation that way versus sitting in the same seats every day is a great way to connect as well. There's just, yeah, any little things here and there, um, just to switch it up, it, 
it can go a long way for a lot of students. I think, oh my gosh, and we are out of time, which is one of those things. I think there might be a couple more links that Sienna's going to share in the chat while we wrap up. But I just want to say thank you so much for coming today because for kids to thrive, the adults on campus have to, to really flex their resilience this year. And so academic leaders have got to support that. Um, do you want to just say a moment about a podcast that you're recommending that we've dropped in here? Ab uh, is oh. favorites. Um, we were just talking earlier about the one with Brene Brown, um, but feel free to listen to any of the Happiness Lab podcasts and I think you'll definitely enjoy. So I was listening to um, a couple of this. It's one of those things too, where you listen to one and then another one gets recommended. You're like, oh, well, I'll listen to that one too. <laughs> um, but that's good. So thank you so much for being here today. And um, if you're watching this, check underneath the video and you'll see the links. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.